All right, welcome everybody uh, to the first seminar of the convention. Uh, we're really lucky to have Frankie Cunningham here from Berkeley Yeast. Give you a little bio on him. He's going to have a, a presentation and then he'll be open to Q&A after that. So give you some background on him. Uh, scientist from on the R&D team at Berkeley Yeast received his PhD in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley in 2022 where he performed research on the overlap between nanoparticles and plant biology. Now at Berkeley Yeast, Frankie leads projects involving new strain development, analytical chemistry, and bioprocess engineering for manufacturing yeast. Today he is joining the session to talk about thiols, where they come from, and how you can increase the thiol levels for maximal tropical flavors in your beer. So welcome, uh, Frankie, everybody. Off. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. All right, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Frankie. I'm coming to you from Berkeley, out in California. I'm um, really excited to be here. I'm a Rochester native, so it's pretty awesome to be back in New York uh, talking about beer. Um, yeah, and today I'm going to talk to you about thiols, uh, how they interact with yeast, and how you can increase thiols in your beer. Uh, so, as an outline, first of all, uh, justify why we care about thiols, what exactly thiols are, uh, and where they come from, uh, how they're produced during the brewing process, um, uh, something we'll introduce called theoretical thiol potential, uh, and how actually in reality in our beers um, this diverges, uh, how we can increase biotransformation and extraction efficiency to increase thiols in our beer and sort of uh, allow that divergence to be minimized a little bit. Uh, how we can tune different parameters to dial in tropical flavor based on the concentration of thiols. Uh, and a little bit at the end about how thiols might relate to sustainable brewing practices. Okay, so why does everyone care about thiols so much? Um, so, in short, uh, thiols are one of the key drivers of tropical flavors in beer. Um, for decades, they've been a really hot topic in the wine world because they are the primary flavor determinants of uh, wine varieties like uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and more recently, with the introduction of uh, new hop varieties like New Zealand hops, uh, which have distinguished themselves from more classic uh, West Coast style hops like sea hops, um, we've found that thiols are, are, are a big component of, of those hop flavor characteristics as well. So in short, the amount of tropical flavor in a given beverage uh, typically scales with the concentration of thiols in that beverage. And so at a small amount or small concentration of thiols in a given beverage, you can expect the tropical flavor intensity to be pretty mild. Uh, it might be there, but it's, uh, it's easily balanced by other flavor components. Uh, however, as you increase the concentration of thiols past certain thresholds, um, the flavor starts to be dominated almost completely by the thiols themselves. And so this is where you get like the really, really juicy, like really like uh, tropical style uh, uh, flavor notes. And so what are thiols exactly? Uh, they look a little something like this. Uh, when we say thiol in the chemistry world, we typically mean any compound that contains sulfur. Uh, however, this is to be distinguished from uh, sulfur off notes that are derived from things like hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so some of the most popular uh, thiols for tropical flavor in beer I've shown here. Uh, you might recognize uh, some of these acronyms 3MH, 3MHA, 4MP. Um, so 3MH is probably the most commonly discussed thiol in beer. Uh, 3MHA is an ester derivative of 3MH. Um, that, uh, as opposed to passion fruit or guava flavor notes, also introduces, um, uh, or sorry, passion fruit or grapefruit flavor notes also introduces a guava note. Um, other thiols like 4MMP can introduce uh, black currant notes, or, uh, or in the case of 3S 4MP, which structurally is pretty similar to 3MH, uh, introduces kind of a general tropical note. Um, the concentrations shown on the bottom row here uh, are the flavor thresholds for each of these compounds. Um, and if you don't have a point of reference, uh, you can trust me when I say that this is in incredibly low. Uh, these are among some of the most uh, uh, sensitive compounds when it comes to flavor detection uh, that we know of. Uh, so much so that even our analytical instrumentation as chemists uh, 
uh, has a hard time detecting these levels of thiols, whereas our, our noses um, can very easily detect these levels. And so where do thiols come from? Well, initially, thiols are derived from uh, plant matter. So inside of the plant cell, in this case, hops or even malt, uh, uh, we see something that we, we, we know as glutathione metabolism. Uh, glutathione metabolism produces molecules that are known as bound thiols. And so that looks like, okay, you can see my cursor here. So that looks like this, where we have a thiol molecule that's bound to another molecule called glutathione. And the plant cell just naturally produces these molecules as a part of its metabolism. Um, these precursors or bound thiols can then be converted um, to a cis bound form, where instead of glutathione, that glutathione molecule is now replaced with a cysteine molecule. Uh, and then further, these uh, thiols can be processed, or bound thiols can be processed into free thiols, shown here all the way on the right. I point out that these precursor molecules or bound thiols, um, another word for them, uh, are completely flavorless. You cannot detect them whatsoever. Uh, however, in the free thiol form, this is where we get like the, the really intense uh, uh, sensitivity um, to their flavor. Uh, and so all three of these forms, more or less, are found uh, in plant matter, uh, including hops and uh, barley malt. However, when we introduce um, precursors to uh, fermentation with yeast, um, the yeast uh, import those precursor precursors, and they undergo what we know as biotransformation, which converts these precursors into free thiols, which are then responsible for tropical flavors. If we look at the distribution of precursors versus free thiols uh, in barley and hops, we actually see that the majority of the thiols uh, in these brewing ingredients are uh, present in the bound form. And so in barley especially, pretty much don't find any free thiol. It's all uh, bound precursor. Uh, and in hops, you get a little bit of free thiol, um, uh, but again, the majority is also in bound form. And so to give you some numbers, um, if we look at malt, there's not that much data on precursors in malt, but what is available, uh, pretty much looks like this. Uh, it can vary a lot uh, depending on the, the malt variety or even the malting process itself. Uh, but it typically is anywhere from around 100 nanograms of precursor per gram of malt. And I'll put these numbers uh, in the context of brewing uh, a little bit later on. And I'll also point out that uh, in adjuncts, you pretty much don't find any precursor either. In the case of free thiols, um, unfortunately, basically get nothing. <laughs> um, so if, if you're looking to add thiols to your beer uh, by introducing free thiols as opposed to precursors, which I'll, I'll talk a lot more about, um, you're not really gonna get any free thiols from malt. So we pretty much rely uh, on hops for that. Uh, and so the amount of free thiols that you can find in hops on the same scale, nanograms per gram, uh, is pretty similar to that of precursors in malt. Uh, as, as well as being pretty variable as well. Uh, so hops like Nelson or Mosaic, uh, you might find a lot of free thiols. And these are, and this is typically why these hops are viewed as favorable for introducing tropical characteristics into beers. Whereas other hops like Saz or even Cascade, uh, which aren't necessarily known for their tropical flavors, in some cases they might be, uh, not so much. Um, uh, we see very little levels of free thiols. Um, and I'll also point out the variability issue again. Um, it really, really matters what hops you're using and where you're getting them from uh, and how they were grown and how they were harvested. All these variables affect the amount of free thiols uh, uh, in the end product. So this, this graph is really meant to be representative uh, but also to point out that um, things can be changed uh, and certain varieties can be bred to have increased thiols. Uh, so one example I'll give is New York Cascade 023. I got this data from Chris uh, who agreed uh, to let me share it. Uh, and they actually bred a variety of uh, Cascade to contain a very high level of uh, thiol precursor. So this, this amount of thiol precursor is shown here. 
um, is on par with how much thiol precursor you would find um, in a good malt, right? So if we think about how precursors are converted to thiols during brewing, it looks something like this. So again, precursors are originally derived from barley and hops. Uh, when you mash and when you uh, add hops during the boil, um, these precursors are then extracted into your wort. Uh, I'll point out that free thiols theoretically are also extracted um, during mashing and uh, boiling. However, um, they're a lot more volatile than precursors. So during the boil, you, you shouldn't really expect to uh, uh, maintain any level of free thiols that are derived from your brewing ingredients. You're pretty much just left with precursors at that point. Uh, so when you actually uh, uh, move that wort into a fermenter, uh, all the yeast has to work with is precursors. And the, and the yeast can, can perform biotransformation uh, to convert some of those precursors into free thiols. You can also introduce uh, additional free thiols um, by dry hopping, which because dry hopping occurs at uh, a lower temperature, you don't lose nearly as much to, uh, to blow off. Cool, uh, so I'll introduce this concept that uh, at Berkeley East we, we talk about a lot, uh, uh, we refer to it as thiol potential. So this is a uh, the theoretical amount of total free thiol that you can expect to find in a finished beer based on the amount of precursor and the amount of free thiol measured in the brewing ingredients. Uh, also taking into account the relative amount uh, of, of each ingredient that's used in a given recipe. So an average amount of malt that's typically used in a brew could be around 300 grams per liter. Given a certain concentration of uh, thiol precursor, um, you can expect uh, some amount of um, uh, thiol precursor extracted in your wort from that, shown here, 210 micrograms per liter. Um, and then given how well, or given the conversion of 100% of that thiol precursor into free thiol, you could expect around 69 micrograms per liter of thiol in your beer, right? Now also, just to put this into perspective, a typical IPA is around zero to 10 micrograms per liter. So this thiol potential is pretty high uh, considering the, the standard, right? And if we look at hops, if you add them on the hot side, so during the boil, um, you don't expect to get any free thiol, as I mentioned, because they're totally volatile. However, you will get some amount of uh, thiol potential from precursor, which would translate to around 26 micrograms per liter. And then from dry hopping on the cold side, uh, the thiol potential is much, actually much lower. Um, simply because uh, uh, you're mostly getting free thiol in that case uh, and not precurs precursor, because we expect the precursors aren't extracted as well at lower temperatures. And so the thiol potential of, of an average beer um, is pretty damn high. Uh, this is, I don't know, somewhere in the, the realm of 100 micrograms per liter, which is, it's, if you've ever tasted a beer with that amount of thiol, it's, it's pretty intense. I wouldn't say it's overbearing, but it's very high. Uh, but your average beer contains far, far lower uh, than that. And so there's a disconnect between how much thiol we expect to get based on these measurements and how much thiol we actually measure. Uh, and it, it's, it comes sort of a conundrum when we realize also that precursors are totally heat stable. Uh, so we ran an experiment at Berkeley East where we, uh, we spiked in pure precursor into, into wort. Uh, we split it in half and we left some of it at room temperature and then we boiled the other half. And then we measured uh, uh, with our analytical instrumentation how much thiol precursor was left. And we found that the boil basically did nothing uh, to, to change the amount of uh, thiol precursor relative to the amount we um, found in the room temperature sample. Uh, which suggests that in contrast to the free thiol form, bound thiols or precursors are totally heat stable. Uh, and so there's really no reason why we shouldn't uh, utilize their thiol potential. Um, right, and, and I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about how you can utilize the thiol potential. And at Berkeley East, we think about it in a few different ways. Uh, we think that the disconnect between uh, measured thiols and thiol potential could be due to poor conversion by the yeast or poor biotransformation by the yeast, uh, poor extraction 
uh, from uh, molten hops or, or a combination of both of those factors. And so with respect to that, that first element, uh, poor conversion, of course, uh, we're interested in using genetic engineering um, to uh, address this uh, by increasing biotransformation. Uh, so again, as I said, uh, through biotransformation, yeast can convert thiol precursors into free thiols. And this happens through the action of an enzyme that we call CSL. Uh, this is short for carbon sulfur lyase. And this carbon sulfur lyase enzyme uh, splits this sulfur carbon bond uh, and allows for the release of, of a free thiol. And uh, in an engineered strain, we can uh, tune this expression uh, such that the total amount of free thiol that is released is over 100 times more than we would find in uh, just a normal wild type strain. In this case, it's a London ale. Uh, so a little more detail about this. Uh, uh, for those of you who are interested, um, if you're not, feel free to take a nap. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so if, if, if we look at uh, a yeast cell, we understand that there's chromosomes inside the yeast cell, inside every, every cell, including us, made of DNA, right? And in DNA, there's many, many thousands of genes encoded uh, in the genome. And each of these genes encodes information uh, that is related uh, to the production of a specific protein, right? So in the example of CSL or carbon sulfur lyase, uh, again, this is also, uh, also pointed, this is known as beta lyase. Uh, people also refer to it as that. Um, carbon sulfur lyase gene encodes the information to produce a carbon sulfur lyase protein, which then catalyzes the formation of free thiols from thiol precursors during fermentation. If we zoom in to a gene, there's a few different elements of a gene, um, one of them being the coding sequence. So this is kind of what we're already familiar with. Uh, it's the sequence that encodes the information for that CSL protein. Uh, and tells the cell how to, uh, the instructions on how to create that protein. There's another element of gene that we call promoter, uh, and that's m more or less just as important uh, as the coding sequence because it tells the cell how many copies of that protein to make and when to make them. Uh, so it could tell the copy to make, or tell the cell to make one copy of this protein at the beginning of fermentation, or tell the, tell the cell to make uh, a million copies of that protein all throughout fermentation. And so that can actually really, really affect um, how using gen genetic engineering uh, can accomplish different goals. So in the case of uh, uh, biotransformation, uh, if you were to use a weak promoter on a CSL gene, which we can uh, sort of introduce uh, through the power of genetic engineering, um, you would expect a small number of proteins to be produced and thus a small amount of thiol to be present in your beer and thus uh, a very mild tropical flavor. And this is kind of what we see in uh, like a typical wild type yeast. They don't really produce that much uh, CSL naturally. However, if you use genetic engineering to introduce a strong promoter um, that tells the cell to make many, many copies of that gene or of that pro CSL protein, um, you then get increased conversion of that precursor into free thiols, and thus you get uh, an increased tropical flavor in your beer. So it's, it's really as simple as that. Uh, if you increase the activity of CSL protein, you can increase the tropical flavors in your beer. Um, and this strategy of genetic, en genet genetic engineering, um, it ties really closely in with um, focusing on precursors uh, for maximizing uh, uh, tropical flavors in your beer. Um, so to address the point of whether or not precursors are effectively extracted from uh, brewing ingredients, um, we've employed a strategy where we just actually add in precursors um, separately. So the brewing process looks exactly the same, uh, where precursors are extracted from barley and hops during the mash and the boil. Um, you then uh, move this wort into a fermenter. Uh, but along with that, you co-pitch uh, purified precursors uh, that are extracted um, from plants and then added uh, to the fermenter. And this basically allows you to tune the amount of precursors available to the yeast. Uh, and along with increased uh, uh, CSL activity allows you to tune the amount of uh, finished styles in your beer.
So as a whole, uh, if we consider all the different routes you can take uh, to tune the amount of dials in your beer, uh, we'll put forward a, a few different suggestions. Uh, so on the lower end of tropical flavor intensity or thiol concentration in a standard like West Coast style IPA or something like that, of course you might consider use, you might not consider using tropical hops. You use your use whatever hops you like for that style. Um, and a uh, regular yeast, whatever ye yeast you're using for that style, and you could expect your thiol levels to be pretty low. However, if you want to introduce a little bit of tropical flavor, you could um, add in a tropical hop addition, maybe in the dry hop, uh, for example, Nelson. Um, or you could use an engineered yeast, uh, which would slightly uh, enhance the conversion of precursors um, that you're deriving from uh, your hops and malt and thus give you a slight boost uh, in tropical flavors. And you would expect the concentration of thiols uh, uh, in either of these strategies to be around one to 10 micrograms per liter, which is, again, pretty standard for um, sort of the average tropical IPA. Uh, and so, for example, at Berkeley Yeast, when we brew with London Ale yeast, this is not an engineered yeast um, without dry hopping, we don't really see any thiols show up in the beer uh, when we dry hop, in this case with Nelson in the middle here. Uh, we see uh, some level of thiol appear in the beer, uh, around one microgram per liter. And again, this is uh, just due to free thiol extraction from the hops directly, um, not due to precursor conversion. Uh, however, if we choose other hops that are uh, known to be, uh, to impart tropical characteristics to a beer, such as New Zealand hops, we see a slight increase. Uh, and the levels of free thiol in your beer uh, on the order of one to two fold. Uh, so just to emphasize that choosing the right kind of hop really matters if you're, if you're uh, going this route. If you really, really want to boost thiols in your beer and you want to make your beer super juicy and thiol driven, uh, then you, you, we really recommend that you take other uh, strategies, um, including spiking in precursor and using an engineered yeast. We'll point out that generally speaking, uh, spiking in precursor uh, won't necessarily increase thiol levels in your beer if you're not using an engineered yeast. The reason being because the, the engineered yeast, uh, again, contains high CSL activity, which is required for precursor conversion. So with just a regular old yeast, um, uh, you might, it's CSL activity is simply not high enough um, to utilize that amount of precursor. And if you go this route, you could expect your uh, your thiol concentrations to be on the order of uh, 10 to upwards of 100 micrograms per liter, uh, which we would classify as really a thiol-driven beer. Uh, so at Berkeley Yeast, uh, we find that uh, it's pretty straightforward to tune the amount of thiol in a finished beer just by tuning the dosage of precursor um, in the fermenter. And so if we add around 400 milliliters of our uh, precursor formulation um, per barrel, uh, we get around 60 to 70 uh, micrograms per liter of thiol total in our beer, which on its own is honestly pretty dank and really good um, and definitely has like a very strong thiol character to it. Uh, although I would say it's easily balanced by other elements. Uh, which, it's that, if that's what you're going for, then this is sort of the regime you might want to operate in, right? However, if you increase the dosage to a liter per barrel of, of uh, in this case, of our precursor formulation, you can uh, boost the levels of thiols extremely high. And in this regime, you are pretty much brewing uh, a thiol-dominant beer. Uh, it's going to be a little more difficult to balance the flavor with something else. Um, uh, but... On, you know, on one hand, it's difficult to balance, but on the other hand, the, the thiol-driven characteristic is, is quite nice. Uh, so as an overview, um, feel free to snap a photo of this or something. Um, this is our recommendation on how you can tune thiols in your beer. Uh, for lower levels of thiols that might um, be masked by certain hop characteristics or you might want to balance in a certain way uh, with other elements of your beer, um, you should really focus on hops uh, or using an engineered yeast without really thinking about precursors. But if you want to boost thiols in your beer, precursors are, are super important, again, because of the high, uh, as well as using a, a engineered yeast because of the high uh, uh, precursor potential.
Uh, and to summarize, um, designing a strategy for uh, increasing files in your beer um, is really brand dependent and gives you like another lever to move or another knob to turn. Um, uh, and in summary, uh, really just depends on how you want to design your recipes, uh, whether or not you want to engineer yeast, want to use engineered yeast, uh, and whether or not you want to spike in precursor. And lastly, I want to leave, leave everyone with uh, a little bit of a thought about how thinking like this might help make your brewing practices more sustainable. Um, so understanding where tropical flavors come from in your beer allows you to stay a lot more informed about selecting ingredients uh, for your brewery. Um, so if you understand that um, you don't need a certain type of hop um, from New Zealand to uh, attain, uh, you know, tropical characteristics in your beer because you can use precursors instead, um, then that's great because you can maybe focus on uh, buying local and or something like that. Um, but th this all goes to, to say that uh, Thinking about files um, and thinking about how they interact with brewing um, gives you uh, a lot more tools in your in your toolbox. Cool, uh, that's all I have for today. Um, again, my name is Frankie. I'm happy to take any questions uh, now or later. Feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. Can, can you talk a little bit about like the tropics and the CRISPR yeast and the what you guys are doing with that? Sure. Yeah. So um, tropics is our uh, hallmark thylized strain. Um, it, uh, it pretty much went over it more or less already, but it uses a, a CSL um, uh, increased CSL activity to increase the conversion of precursors uh, in wort into free thiols. Um, we've introduced this uh, genetic uh, variation into several parent strains, uh, including London Ale, uh, as well as Chico, um, and a couple other ones, um, a couple lager strains as well. Um, so you can retain the characteristics of any given style um, while just increasing thiols uh, in that given beer. Um, on that same note of cropping that yeast and for multiple generations, is that engineering kind of stay with it? Yeah, it's totally stable. I I, I don't know the most recent numbers. Um, I I think generally brewers have repitched that yeast like seven to eight times and still retain the tropical flavor. Maybe actually you know better than I because you're actively using it, but um, uh, it. Like from a theoretical standpoint, it should be totally stable. Remember that point you just uh, get in the uh, precursors for per batch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the the free thiols are produced during uh, active fermentation. Yeah. Is the CSL enzyme purchasable on its own? That is a great question. I don't. I wish I knew the answer to that. I don't know. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I'm a lot younger than most of the brewers in this room, so in, during my time in exposed to this world, uh, I've never seen it for sale. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about increasing files through mash hopping of all things. Um, uh, are you basically saying because of because it's hot side, like you're just basically gonna, you know, uh, it's all gonna go up, up the stack because of the heat and the, and the volatilization? Yeah, so not necessarily uh, in that case. Um, so mash hopping, uh, the thought behind that is that when you're in the process of converting thiol precursor into a free thiol, there's actually several steps that I totally didn't talk about um, that are involved, uh, that, are, that aren't, uh, that have nothing to do with the carbon sulfur lyase, CSL enzyme. Uh, but for simplicity, I just focused on that today. Um, so there's actually three or four steps leading up to the, the, the action of the CSL enzyme. Um, 
that, uh, I guess to get back to your question too, you would also need to potentially spike in those enzymes uh, uh, if you were able to procure them commercially. But in the case of mash hopping, the thought process is that um, during the mash, uh, at the mash temperature, um, you're also optimizing for activity of certain enzymes that convert uh, GLUT3MH into CIS3MH, uh, which is sort of an intermediate in that conversion pathway. Uh, and CIS3MH is a little bit easier for your average yeast to, to convert into a free thiol uh, because you're just simply re removing one step from the whole process. Um, so uh, it, it's possible that mash hopping does do that. Um, and I've heard people have a lot of success with it. I will point out though that um, mash hopping with hops that are high in precursors um, can sometimes affect the final flavor of your beer, um, particularly if those hops have vegetal characteristics. Um, so the choice of hop in that case is also still really important if you're gonna mash hop. So it's so taking back, so that would New York Cascade that's that's a good question. I, it, the, theoretically, it might be. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe Chris actually has some data on that. Um, unfortunately, he's giving a talk at the same time. <laughs> um, so. yeah. I would definitely talk to talk to them about that because I, I can't say for sure. Yeah. The, what's the viability of just directly dosing with three thiols? Is there limitations on that, or? Um, you could, theoretically. Uh, to buy them at the scales you would need would be prohibitively expensive. That's a cost thing. Yeah, I totally. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious if you've done any research about, like, labor stability of the beers. Like, over time, do the thiols taper off? Yeah, totally. I actually had a slide of that. I took it out um, in the end. Um, but we, we have uh, investigated the flavor stability in packaged beer out to uh, three months, and the thiol levels are pretty stable. Um, I think the only number I can remember is at one month, it was like still 90% there. Um, it also does depend on which thiol you're looking at and the level of oxygen in the beer. Um, so uh, the, the data I just mentioned specifically referenced 3MH. Um, so when oxygen levels are really low, 3MH is super stable. However, um, uh, 3MHA, which is the ester of 3MH, uh, tends to degrade even when oxygen levels are low. So there's some other um, uh, degradation process that might be happening there. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on which thiol you're looking at. Uh, and the concentration of them and a few other things, yeah. So do you, like, is there like a, do you overdo all those files? Like, yeah, it, obviously it's, it's definitely a subjective flavor experience. Um, they can be pretty strong um, and certain files uh, have, like for example, for MMP, I personally am not a huge fan of. So I think like at high concentrations, it, I'm not, I don't really like that diesel character, right. but some people might, you know, it, it really depends. Um, definitely if you're boosting really, really high, it's gonna be pretty gross, but uh, we, we have never gotten to that point yet, but it, eventually it could be, so, yeah. Uh, anecdotally, maybe like in the 500 to 1,000 range, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So thiols being, uh, you know, sulfur compounds, it, has anyone, you or anyone noticed uh, increase in light struck character? If you say pour that beer into a glass in the summertime and the light hits <laughs> That's a great question. We haven't done those kinds of tests, but I would be really interested in knowing for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now <laughs> uh, there's someone over here, maybe, no? In the back, yeah. Is the diesel character uh, one of the only negative aspects when you start to really push the upper limit, or are there other? Uh, I guess that's specifically for 4-MMP, which um, might be produced at high levels, depending on the engineered yeast that you're using. Um, I, I can say for, for our yeast, uh, the primary thiol that's produced is 3-MH and 3-MHA. Um, but uh, anyway, to get back to your question, I, I don't 
think there's other negatives uh, besides the the intensity of the flavor. Um, I wouldn't expect it to have an effect on yeast health or anything like that, especially because these thiol compounds are, um, compared to other molecules in the cell, are actually at a pretty low concentration. Uh, we're just particularly sensitive to smelling and tasting them. I'm yep. curious if you could speak briefly about the terpene strains that you guys offer as well. Sure, yeah. Um, so we have a strain called Super Bloom uh, that uh, produces uh, a couple different terpenes, um, one of them being ger geraniol uh, through biotransformation. Um, and the, the characteristic flavor note with those strains is hoppy and citrus. Um, there's several breweries who have had pretty good success with that strain. And in, in the beginning, the idea behind that strain was to sort of, uh, you know, replace hops, you know, but it, it, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, it's, it's producing terpenes that are, that work in concert uh, with other hops. So for example, you could use that strain, um, uh, you know, in combination with like a really dank or piney hop, um, and that strain will, will add some citrus or, or fresh notes to that. Do they require any sort of precursor, or is it just sort of a... They do, they do require precursors um, if you zoom in on the biology of it, um, but we haven't tested a, a precursor addition for that particular strain. Yeah. So I, I guess to, to be totally clear, the precursors in that case would just be derived from uh, uh, barley and hops in your wort. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, here we go. Um, with your thiol boost, uh, have you done any tests comparing that um, with mash hopping as compared to just the thiol boost without uh, the additional mash hopping as well? Um, we haven't tested that. Um, certainly would be cool data to have. Um, Do you recommend mash hopping with the use of your thiol boost? Uh, I don't think it would change, I don't think it would substantially change the. Um, the total free thiol uh, profile, um, because in that specific case, the precursors that you're loading in are going to be way higher than what you would ever get from mash hopping at all. Um, so it, it's you could give it a shot. Maybe mash hopping will introduce other things that we're not predicting um, that that affect the free thiol uh, profile. Um, but yeah, it, I think it's something worth experimenting with. It's hard to say. Uh, we we have not really tested them um, mainly because we formulated thiol boost um, to work specifically with um, our tropic strains, um, and so we don't necessarily expect it to work with other um, other products. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Um, I was going to ask uh, on the remarks earlier about sustainability um, and hearing earlier about the short boil or the no boil. Uh, have you done any tests regarding like bio levels and that? Because like, like you're skipping that volatile section you're talking mm -hmm. about. With the sure. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, you could preserve a lot of your free thiols doing a no boil brew. We haven't tested it, though. Yeah. But that definitely would be cool to try. So can you have higher levels of precursor in exceeding capacity of uh, yeast to utilize it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, that, that is like totally the reason why uh, we only recommend dosing precursor if you're using an engineered yeast, because a normal yeast just won't do anything with it. Yep. I'm sorry, I know this is a whole can of worms, but if we're talking about not mash hopping, <clears throat> Do you have any suggestions or anecdotal evidence for when you start introducing hops, like sort of day one versus biotransformation versus like late dry out? Yeah, that's, anything that's in the kettle. A good question. I 
So in terms of, if we're thinking just about precursor conversion, you want the precursors to be there on day zero, because um, then you'll get the maximum utilization of those precursors. Um, however, if you're thinking about free files, um, the timing of dry hopping probably isn't as important uh, because we expect the files to be extracted relatively quickly. Um, so it, it depends on if, if you're thinking about it from the perspective of precursor conversion or just introducing free files directly from hops. So certain leaks are great for like cleaning that file bond or whatever, and certain leaks are great for file transformation. Is, is there a yeast that can kind of be both? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in my experience, London is a decent strain for hazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see a reduction in files if you dry up the material Um. I think there's a, a like a moderate reduction, yeah, um, but it we don't know if it's because it's being absorbed, uh, or it's there's something else. Maybe the files are introducing an enzyme that's degrading the free files that are produced from precursor, um, and it's just easily detectable because when you're using engineered yeast, you have so much more free file anyway. Um, uh, but certainly dry hopping uh, while also using an engineered yeast is a good option that I think a lot of brewers use or actually do with this yeast as well, yeah. I'm sorry, just for clarity, um, you say the precursors need to be there on, on day zero for the biotransformation. Um, are you suggesting growing hops in uh, like, yeah, as soon as right after pitching on the yeast? Um, if, if, you're, if you want the free thiols to be derived from precursors, then yeah, that would theoretically be the best option. Or if you were using a precursor formulation that you're spiking in, oh, right. um, such as style right. boost or something else on the market, um, then yeah, you would want it there as early as possible um, because biotransformation requires that the yeast start actively fermenting, uh, which the time window of active fermentation, as you know, is, is uh, relatively small. Have you noticed an impact of pitch rate on transformation of the free thiol or the Precursors? Yeah, so we, uh, I took that data out too, <laughs> but um, that we, uh, we have observed that increasing the pitch rate up to, I think, um, I think 2 million cells per mil per Play Doh. Um, I, can, I can, if you find me later, I can give you the exact number, um, has increased the amount of precur precursor conversion uh, like twofold. Similarly, like, Oxygenation levels as well? Uh, I don't think we've tested oxygenation, but it, that might also have a similar effect, yeah. Right. Cool. Thank cool. you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Frankie. Mm -hmm.